right, we'll get started now. Um, so I appreciate everybody being here. It is good to see everybody. A <laughs> uh, few announcements I would like to make. Um, today we are going to be talking about the Cherokee War, the Cherokee War of 1776. And I will mention to you that on August the 16th, that's a Friday night, I'll be speaking at the Simpsonville Museum, um, Revolutionary War Museum, and I'll be speaking on the life and times of Andrew Pickens, who is one of my true heroes. Then the next day, and all of you are invited to this, we're having a field trip, and we're going to um, some of the places where I'm going to be discussing um, uh, tonight, and primarily we're going to Tomasi, and this is the site of the Cherokee town of Tomasi. It's also the location where Andrew Pickens fought the ring fight, which we'll be talking about this evening. Andrew Pickens built his last home in Tomasi, and um, we'll see the actual site where he breathed his last breath in uh, 1817, um, where he um, had his residence near where the Battle of uh, Tomasi was. And also along with that, we will visit Oconee Station, which was the last rock house ever built in um, South Carolina. Now that's post-Revolutionary War, that's 1792-1797. Uh, I see many familiar faces here that were at the field trip. Um, that we went to a couple of weeks ago at uh, the Kelly Block House and Fort Lindley. And it's good to see everybody um, from mm -hmm. that visit. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed that. And after we go to um, Tomasi, the following month, we're going to go to Hayes Station. And that's closely associated with the British period. That's the site where Bloody Bill uh, Cunningham massacred uh, 18 um, Lloyd, uh, patriots that were members of the uh, Little River Regiment. And that was a tragedy, intense tragedy that happened within 20, 25 miles from here. There's a lot of very local history that happened right here. And in October, we're going to go to Cal I welcome everybody to come to these field trips. I think you'll get a lot out of them. And you'll be able to learn more about what we're talking about tonight. Uh, it will have a little bit more relevance to you. So tonight we are talking about the Cherokee War of 1776. To understand what happened during that time period, I am going to describe the relationship with the Cherokees throughout the period of English settlement. And it will be much more clear why the events that had happened in 1776 had to happen. The first war with Indian tribes in South Carolina was the Yamasi War in uh, 1750. And uh, this is not very well documented. There were two plantations that were wiped out during this time. Um, but it was the first sort of organized uh, resistance <laughs> to European settlement with the conflicts with the settlers. The Umasi War was a confusing time. Um, it was really beyond, uh, included much more than just the Umasi tribe. The Catawbas were involved, the Creeks were involved, the Cherokees were involved. The Catawbas were allies with the European settlers. The Catawbas were enemies with the Creeks and the Cherokees. The Catawbas were enemies with everybody. Um, the Catawbas were a Sioux-based tribe. The Cherokees and the Creeks were Iroquois-based tribes. They had different customs, different cultures, and they did not get along the way together. The Catawbas and the Cherokees had quite a number of uh, incidents. There supposedly in like 1450 they had a major battle, and at that point they established boundaries between them. The Broad River was supposed to be the extent of the Catawba um, uh, territory, and uh, the Cherokees weren't supposed to go over the Broad, the Catawbas weren't supposed to go on this side of the Broad. And it, 
one of those tribes found an enemy on the wrong, in the wrong place, that enemy suffered very brutal and severe consequences. So another thing that's important to understand is Cherokee culture. And I'm fascinated with Cherokee culture. I'm fascinated with Cherokee culture from an anthropological point of view. I'm fascinated with European culture from an anthropological uh, point of view as well. But um, the Cherokees thought very differently from Europeans. I mean, things that make perfect sense to us made no sense whatsoever to the Cherokees. And what made perfect sense to the Cherokees made no sense whatsoever to the Europeans. And I'm going to point out these differences in culture and understanding. So, you know, just as illustrations of what I'm talking about. But the key to understanding Cherokee culture is knowing how tribal law existed, the clan culture. In the Cherokee um, towns, there were seven um, clans, like the Payne clan, the Bird clan, um, the Wolf clan, and so forth. A healthy Cherokee town had all seven clans. So um, children belong to the clan of their mother. So whatever your mother's clan was, that's what you, you were. The Cherokees were a matrilineal society. This is totally different from the Europeans, which is patrilineal. So um, what that meant was fathers did not raise their children. The children were raised by the brothers of the mother. The uncles raised their children. The uncles would be, say, members of the wolf clan and would teach the children the um, uh, values of the wolf clan. The wolf clan was basically known as, as the warriors. A mother, a woman, never married within her clan. She always married somebody from an opposite clan, and she chose her husband. And when she got tired of her husband, all she had to say was, hit the road, Jack. <laughs> that was it. That was a charity divorce. When she got tired of the old man, she kicked him out. And he went back to his own clan or wherever it was he was going to go to. So with these um, seven different clans, they maintained order amongst themselves or there were pretty dire consequences. So if somebody from one clan killed somebody from the other clan, say a wolf clan member killed a pay clan uh, member, it was up to the wolf clan to punish that murder, and he would be killed. That would be just punishment. Or somebody of equal right would be killed, and that was just punishment. If the Wolf Clan did not kill, um, give just punishment to the murderer, then the Payne Clan had the right to kill that person or any person of equal right. And once that was done, justice happened, and uh, everybody went merrily on their way. So say uh, uh, somebody from the Wolf Clan murdered somebody from the Paint Clan and then left. He went down to Florida or something like that. Well, he went down to Florida knowing that somebody in his stead was going to be, was going to be killed sir, for, his, um, uh, for his crime. So this kept them... Uh, you know, fairly much in line. This is how Cherokee tribal law existed. And we were going to see how this system led to major conflicts with um, the European settlers. So, uh, you know, things were kind of cruising along. The, the Cherokees did not like the encroachment of uh, European settlers onto their territories. They resisted this time after time. There were treaties made time after time. 
the um, royal government passed a decree in 1739 that no person of European descent could, could set foot in Indian territory. And that was just made the Indians real happy. Except for one thing, and they never defined where Indian territory was. So this led to major conflicts. And um, when the Europeans saw how fertile the land was in the Long Cane community, which is close to 96, between 96 and Georgia, then, um, you know, many, many settlers came into that area, which the Cherokees regarded as their own. So there was, there was a conflict there. Another source of conflict was the fact that um, the French and the Spaniards both coveted uh, North American lands. The French were coming down from uh, Canada and so forth through the Ohio Valley. The British were um, you know, just very fearful of this. So as a result of this, the British built two forts. One fort was at Kiwi, which was the main uh, Cherokee trading town in the lower area, uh, lower towns of the Cherokee tribes. The other fort was in Tennessee at Fort Loudoun. And this fort was 150 miles um, away from uh, the fort in Kiwi, which was Fort Prince George. So with the conflicts that came with the French and so forth, in 1754, the French and Indian War happened. And um, the Cherokees were allies of the British government at that time. The Cherokees allied with George Washington at that time. And the Cherokees were led by a European Indian trader that uh, was very popular among the Cherokees. And this fellow's name was Richard Paris. Now, Richard Paris, who was the first European settler in Greenville County, he built a plantation on the falls of the Reedy River, right where the Liberty Bridge is. This is where Paris's plantation was. So, Richard Paris was a captain in the um, Royal um, Army that was. Uh, you know, fighting against the French, and Paris led a contingent of 200 Cherokees to Fort Duquesne, which is now where Pittsburgh is, at the uh, confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers, which forms the Ohio River. So the French had a fort there called Fort Duquesne. Fort Duquesne was not easily defended. It was in low land. It dominated the waterways, but the higher ground surrounding Fort Duquesne made Fort Duquesne virtually indefensible. So when Paris and um, many other um, colonial troops showed up on the surrounding heights of Fort Duquesne, the French abandoned the fort. They just withdrew. And uh, Richard Paris claims that he was the first European to set foot in uh, Fort Duquesne after that was uh, after it was abandoned. Well, the main crux of the Cherokee War of 1776 occurred in 1758 when um, Fort Duquesne was abandoned because then the Cherokees started traveling home. But as they traveled home, their horses were stolen from settlers in Virginia. Bad guys in Virginia stole the Cherokees' horses. So what did the Cherokees do? They go around to the surrounding uh, Europeans and say, what clan were those people who stole our horses? And the settlers say, clan? We ain't got no clan. We're all one plan. Everybody belongs to the same plan. So when Cherokee fall, somebody stole their horses, they stole the horses from that plan. So as they were in North Carolina, they stole the horse, they stole horses back. Not the same horses, but they stole horses. And the people in North Carolina do not like horse things. I'm telling you that right now. 
And uh, they started you know, battling and shooting at each other, and 30 North Carolina settlers were, um, uh, were killed. And the Cherokees get back, and uh, they're back at their homes in uh, upstate South Carolina, western Georgia, western North Carolina, and eastern Tennessee. And the British were incensed over this, so they decided to embargo the Cherokees. They would not, you know, trade with the Cherokees. And trade with the Cherokees was very important. It was important to the Cherokees, and it was lucrative to the, the British government. The Cherokees would trade deer skins and medicinal plants for muskets, pots and pans, hunting knives, things of this nature. And when the British imposed an embargo, it really hurt the Cherokee um, nation. And uh, they, wanted, uh, they wanted to see how they could make peace and how they could resolve the situation. And the British demanded 30 um, Cherokees blood ransom. They were going to hang them. They wanted to um, make up for the 30 North Indians that were killed. So the Cherokees sent down a um, party under a white flag of about 22 leading Cherokee men, Cherokee chief, chiefs, sent them down to Charleston to negotiate. And again, this is under a white flag. So um, the British government said, look, you've got to give us the 30 men or there's, there's no negotiation. So the Cherokees returned home, um, you know, disappointed and so forth, and they were escorted back on the way home with, with an armed guard. And of course, halfway back, the armed guard turned on the Cherokee chief and held him as hostage, which was not part of the deal, which was against, you know, the flag of truth. And they took these hostages now back to Fort Prince George in, um, in Kiwi, and they held them there or ransom until 30 um, Cherokee um, graves would be produced to, um, you know, pay for the sins of the people who killed the North Carolinians. And so this was, you know, everybody was mad at everybody else. I mean, who, who, who did the wrong? Who, uh, it's just one series of retribution after another. Where did it start? You can't, there's no starting, but where did it end? You can't tell where it ends either. So the Cherokees in Kiwi, they sent another flag of truce to the fort at, Ki at Kiwi, Fort Prince George. And they said they wanted to have a parlay with the commanding officer, who was Lieutenant Courtmore. So Lieutenant Courtmore walked out of the fort towards the Kiwi River to meet with the um, chiefs who wanted to talk with them. Well, the Cherokees had an ambush set up. Along the banks of the Big River, they had warriors with rifles, and when uh, Cordmore came out, they shot and they killed Lieutenant Cordmore, right in front of the whole garrison in the fort and so forth. Immediately when that happened, the hostages that were in uh, uh, Fort Prince George, they were killed. So then the war was on. Um, in the meantime, the 150-man uh, garrison, which was at Fort Loudoun in Tennessee, 150 miles away, 30 days march away, they were completely surrounded. They were uh, besieged. And the best resolution that the uh, garrison at Fort Loudoun could come up with was if they surrendered their weapons, the Cherokees would let them march away unmolested. So uh, they surrendered their weapons and they started marching. And there are two um, tales to this story. One of them says that the uh, Cherokees, when they entered Fort Loudon, they found a bunch of weapons that had been buried in the floor of the fort, and so that violated the truth. The other story is that the Cherokees were just going to slaughter these 150 unarmed men anyway. And all 150 men of the Fort Loudon garrison, you know, were, were killed. The um, commander of the fort, he was scalped alive, and he was forced to dance till he died. And then they stuffed dirt into his mouth, and they said, if you're so hungry for land, 
you know, on your camera. So um, these events, you know, were about in 1758, and at this time the British sent uh, excursions into the Cherokee territory to punish the Cherokees for what they had done. And many of these excursions, I mean, they would, you know, kill a lot of Indians, but they would also suffer a lot of ambushes, and they weren't very successful. The first one was just semi-successful. The second one, was the next year, was a little more successful. The third expedition under uh, General James Graff, they just went through and they just wiped out all the Cherokee villages. I mean, it was annihilation. And um, that chastised the Cherokees for, um, you know, those transgressions, those estimates. And then it got to be uh, relatively peaceful again, <laughs> roughly for the next 15 years. The Cherokees reestablished their towns. They had 16 towns in South Carolina. These are in um, Oconee and Pickens County. Greenville um, County and Anderson County were Cherokee hunting grounds. They did not have permanent towns here, but they would come through and forage quite a bit. Um, th things heated up, you know, with the uh, Revolutionary War, and last week, or last month rather, I talked about the prelude to the Revolution, all the factors that were leading to shots being fired. Uh, one of the big considerations was what side was the Cherokees going to um, follow? Were they going to be fight with the Loyalists, or were they going to fight with the Patriots? And both sides wanted to curry the favor of the Cherokees. So one of the things that the Patriots did was they sent a wagon train load of uh, shot and powder to the Cherokees so that they could uh, have their winter hunt and provide uh, deer skins uh, for the settlers with their, you know, trade, their, that lucrative trade that they had. Well, a uh, loyalist force under the uh, command of uh, Patrick Cunningham, who was one of the famous Cunningham clan from uh, Long Cane's community, he captured the uh, wagon train of uh, shot and powder, and there was a standoff at 96, um, a three-day siege. There was an agreement made there, and uh, Richard Paris was highly involved in uh, negotiating that truce, but uh, Patrick Cunningham, after the siege was over, he uh, escaped with his shot and powder, and he went into the wildest place he possibly could, the most secluded place he could possibly think of to uh, get away from any um, uh, forces of the Patriots who might be chasing him down to get that shot and powder. So the wildest place he could go to about six or eight miles from here. It's on the banks of the Reedy River at the Cane Break, uh, which is close to Fort Shoals Road, between Fort Shoals Road and South Harrison Bridge Road. And that's where he encamped. And the Patriot forces got wind of that and sent a flying column under Major Danger Thompson, 1300 men, and they surrounded Patrick Cunningham on December 22nd, 1775. And this is you know, seven months before the Declaration of Independence is signed. So the the only pitch battle in Greenville County occurred on that day when the 1,300 um, militiamen of uh, Major Thompson almost surrounded the 200 men of Patrick Cunningham. 130 of those men were captured and 70 escaped into the wilds of Cherokee territory. And Patrick Cunningham was one of the ones who, who did escape. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the Battle of the Cane Break, and again, you know, that was, that was right here. Um, and it, that battle was part of what is referred to as the Snow Campaign, because the moment that the battle was over, and it was more of a skirmish than anything, um, after about 30 minutes, and the battle was over, it started uh, snowing. 
and it snowed on that day like it's hardly ever snowed in uh, the state of South Carolina since. It was 30 inches of snow. Um, but during this snow campaign, one of the biggest goals and objects was to round up the Patriot, the um, loyalist leaders. Now, Robert Cunningham, Patrick Cunningham's brother, he had been arrested earlier, and he was shipped down to Charleston. Richard Paris was um, captured a few days before the Battle of Cambrai. He was marched down to Charleston. Um, Thomas Fletcher was ca captured. He was one of the loyalist leaders. Moses Kirkland escaped. He went up north and fought with the uh, British forces there until uh, he came back south in uh, 1780. So the leading men of the Loyalist forces were, were captured, and um, there was no Loyalist leadership at that point. And the Patriot forces came through, forcing serious Loyalists out of their homes, displacing these people. Where did they go? They go to the one place where one uh, European man is never supposed to go, and that's the wilds of Cherokee territory. There were hundreds of displaced Tories that uh, left their homes and moved to the uh, Indian Territory. And they took up with you know, Indian families and wives and, and that sort of thing. One of the primary places where these Tories gathered was Richard Paris's home, his plantation on the falls of the Reedy River. Now, um, Paris had a, a two-story um, plantation home he had a sawmill, he had a grist mill, he had a whiskey still, he had a fort. So there was, you know, that was a big center of activity. During this time, Harris is in, in Charleston. He's in a dungeon. He's in a dungeon in chains. But uh, Mrs. Paris is allowing his place to be used as a staging ground for Cherokee attacks. Now, during this time, the British were planning to take Charleston by the sea, and they sent an, armar an armada under Sir Peter Parker to blast their way through um, this um, half-finished fort on Sullivan's Island and take over Charleston Harbor. And this was on June 28th of uh, 1776, and when the battles of Sullivan's Island occurred. But the British plan was to have a two-front war. They also wanted to have the Cherokees attack the western frontier while the British were taking over Charleston and the Patriot forces would be divided. Well, we all know that um, the, Sir Peter Parker literally got his tail shot uh, in the Battle of Southern Valley. Um, and the British forces, you know, got severely defeated during that time, and they never took Charleston by sea. But still, the Cherokee uprisings uh, continued, and they happened right here. Uh, this was the, the uh, borderline between European civilization and Cherokee territory. And the Cherokees were on the warpath right here, all along the border, Greenville County and Spartanburg County, and Greenville County and Lawrence County. And one of the um, incidents that set everything off was in June of 1775. This is before, um, right before the Battle of uh, Sullivan's Island. This is the Hampton Massacre. This is um, involving Wade Hampton's great grandfather. Uh, Wade Hampton's great uncles, he had at least five great uncles. Four of them were colonels in the uh, South Carolina militia, and they were some of the finest men there ever was. The, the Hampton brothers were really good, good fighters. Two of them fought under Sumter, and two of them fought under um, uh, Mary. The fifth brother, brother was named Preston, and he was an Indian trader. But apparently, he was not a very popular Indian trader, 
the Indians felt like, the Cherokees felt like he was taking advantage of them. So one day in June 1775, a group of Indians comes out of the woods and approaches um, great-grandfather um, Wade Hampton. And the father knew, uh, the grandfather knew the Indian chief, so he went out the door to, to greet him. And so he shook hands with the chief, and as they were shaking hands, a shot rang out, and Preston Hampton was shot in the chest and killed immediately. And at the same time, the Indian chief that was shaking um, uh, Mr. Hampton's hand pulled out a tomahawk and bashed his head in with the other. There were three or four adults there that were killed and scalped. There was an infant baby grabbed by the ankles, swung around, his head bashed against the side of the house. There was a eight-year-old boy who was there who, I think he may have been an orphan. He was kidnapped. Now, the Cherokees, if, if a child was between the age of five and ten, they would be kidnapped by the Cherokees and brought and, and tried to be raised as a Cherokee. If a child was five or younger, that was too much trouble. They'd kill and scalp them. If somebody was older than ten, they would kill and scalp them. Now, what do we think about scalping children under the age of five? How courageous is that, you know? If we're going to scalp somebody, we're going to scalp the biggest, bravest, meanest brave that there is. But that is not the way the Cherokee um, mindset was. The most valuable scalps to the Cherokees were the women and children. And what that proved was, when they got those scouts, they had penetrated the inner psyche of the enemy. They had inflicted major, maximum punishment on the enemy. So we don't think that way. That's the way they thought. And the women and children, you know, you had one of their scouts. You really, really did good. So after they left great-grandfather Hampton's house, he was on the Tiger River in uh, Spartanburg County. They went a little ways down the road to the home of Preston Hampton. And uh, Preston's wife was, was in the woods at this time. But her two children were there at home. And she witnessed the Cherokees murdering and scalping her children. And uh, Mrs. Hampton, she never spoke again the rest of her life. She was so traumatized by So that was one incident of probably eight or so settlers being killed. Another settlement that was raided was the settlement of Jacob Height, H-I-T-E. Jacob Height was a friend of Richard Paris. But it didn't matter to the Indians whether it was a loyalist or a patriot, you know, um, family that they were killing, murdering, plundering, it's just going to all the same plan, we'll just, we'll just kill them all. Jacob Hyde wasn't, wasn't at home, but his wife and children were, and his, um, uh, his children were killed, and his wife was kidnapped. And this is unusual. This is the only instance I know of, of a, an adult being kidnapped. Um, I don't know if she's being kidnapped for ransom or, or just exactly what. But uh, we'll hear a little bit more about Mrs. Hyde a little bit later on. We do have an eyewitness account of what happened during those times, written by a fellow named Matthew Brown when he was applying for his pension in 1832, 50 years after the fact. And Matthew Brown was stationed at the Kelly Block House, which we visited you know, a week or two ago, for those of y'all who were on that field trip. Um, the Kelly Block House is on Liberty Barker Road, just about six or eight miles down Fairview Road, close by. I mean, we have people living here that live almost next to Liberty Barker Road. So Matthew Brown is stationed at the Kelly Block House. And during this time, there was like 30 or 40 block houses all around the uh, Indian uh, uh, Cherokee border. These were block houses that the settlers went to for protection uh, when the Indians were on the warpath. War 
and most of these block houses were started with the first Cherokee War, 1758-1761. They'd fallen into disrepair, but then when the, you know, um, animosity started heating up again, these block houses were, you know, reestablished and stocked with food, water, ammunition, anything you would need to withstand a um, attack by the Cherokees. And Matthew Brown was at Kelly Block House and he described his job that he had there over a 30 day period. What he did was he went from uh, Pioneer Settlement to Pioneer Settlement to Pioneer Settlement, burying dead settlers who had been scouted by the Cherokees. 31. This is within a 20 mile radius of the Kelly Block House because if you went further than 20 miles, some other Block House was going to bury those dead settlers. There were a total of 60 settlers that were killed during this time. So, um, you know, the Patriot forces knew that this was going on and so forth, and so they started gathering an army. They started gathering an army at 96 under General Andrew Williamson. General Williamson was the leading Patriot commander um, during this time. Directly under General Williamson was Andrew Pickens, and under Pickens was Colonel, um, he was captain at this time, Robert Anderson. Williamson, Anderson, w Williamson, Pickens, Anderson. These are three important characters throughout the, the remainder of the war, and we'll be talking quite a bit about them. So um, while Matthew Brown is at Kelly Block House, they get information that there's going to be an attack on their sister block house, which was Fort Lindley, which was 15 miles away. That the Cherokees that night were going to uh, attack Fort Lindley. Now, Fort Lindley was a fort that was built during the first Cherokee War. It's right there in, Charles, in uh, Lawrence County, maybe 25 miles from here. And we went there, and it's, a, it's one of the few actual sites that we know is still in existence. It was a two-story log blockhouse. It was surrounded by a palisaded fence. It had a 10-foot um, wide, 6-foot deep trench around it. I believe it had elevated firing posts, um, shooting platforms like gabions and so forth. And the word was that Matthew Brown got that 300 Cherokees and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokees were going to attack the fort that night. So the garrison at Kellett Block House repaired, is the word he used, repaired to the site of Fort Little. And when they got there, they got there at dusk. And they found 150 men of the Little River Regiment, Lawrence County's finest, camped out in the fields surrounding the fort. And they got there and they said, the Cherokees are coming, they're on the fort path, you know, they're coming, they're coming. Well, Lawrence County's finest didn't receive that news very well because they were drunk. <laughs> they had been in the room, and they were so drunk that they leveled their rifles at the approaching rescuers. What are you talking about? There ain't no Indians coming here. So finally, Commander Jonathan Downs, who was another hero, he gained control of his men. He stopped the run, and he brought his men into the fort. So you know, maybe 50 settlers, maybe 50 from Kelly's Block House, 150 of uh, the Lawrence County Regiment, Little River Regiment. Um, also, fortuitous, fortuitively, um, fortunately, Colonel Beard had arrived with 300 men that he was taking from the Dutch Fork area to meet up with General Williamson in 96. And they were going to stop over at Fort Lindley before they continued their journey. So with Colonel Beard's 300 men, 
now we have 600 men in, in the fort versus uh, the 600 Cherokees and Tories. Now, there's two eyewitnesses accounts to, to this battle, and Matthew Brown says there were 600 on each side. We also have an account from David Tanning, who was the finest guy Lawrence County ever produced, but he was a Tory. But um, he says there were 245 attackers. And he describes leaving from Paris Plantation. They marched down the Reedy River, and uh, then they followed Raven Creek to Fort Levy. And at midnight, the Cherokees surrounded Fort Levy. And a brisk fire ensued. For about a two hour period, there was lots of fire going back and forth and back and forth. And um, there were few casualties. Uh, one second hand account says, due to the bravery of the defenders of the fort, the attack was repulsed. Um, the next day, the defenders of the fort marched out in a um, skirmish line half a mile wide uh, looking for survivors or wounded or whatever and they came across a clearing three miles away and they found 30 pack horses there um, with saddlebags and uh, food um, saddles and so forth just haphazardly strewn about and they found the commission papers of Captain Leonard so Captain Lindley owned the land where the fort was. He owned the fort, but he was a loyalist, justice of the peace, and he was displaced. He was captured at the Battle of the Cambridge. He was marched down to Charleston. He was given parole and let, let loose, but he couldn't go back home because Jonathan Downs had occupied his home in the meantime and fortified the fort there at Fort Lindley. So uh, James Lindley attacked his own fort and was unsuccessful. Well, from there, the army gathered in 96. And, um, you know, they were going to avenge the death of 60 settlers. And they started marching into Cherokee territory. So the um, Battle of Fort Lindley happened on July 15th, 1776. Towards the end of July, um, the Patriot forces got word that Alexander Cameron, who was the assistant Indian chief for uh, the royal government, and Cameron was the one who was uh, rallying the Cherokees to fight against the settlers. It was Cameron who was pushing these Cherokees to to attack um, the uh, frontier. He was the guy, he was the mastermind behind this plan. So uh, Williamson gets word that uh, Cameron is at uh, the village of Kissimmee, which is on the Seneca River. The Seneca River doesn't exist anymore. It's under the bottom of Lake Parker. Um, Kiwi, Kiwi River, which is uh, about right here, it flows into Lake Harlow. Roughly in this area here is um, where uh, the Battle of the Seneca occurred. Like I said, it's, it's under Lake Harlow, but it's it's adjoining the campus of uh, Clemson University. So that's where that Cherokee town was. And it was nighttime that they were having a forced march to try to surround the town of Seneca in the morning. Well, the Cherokees knew that they were coming, and they laid in ambush. And leading the um, column going towards the Seneca was um, a Jewish settler named Francis Salvador. Uh, Francis Salvador owned 200 acres in the Long Cage community. He was a very popular guy. He was the first um, man of the Jewish faith who was elected to a parliamentary uh, position in, uh, in America. He's revered by, the, by um, Jews, you know, to this day. So he was leading the um, column, 
And that's where the Cherokees attacked in the middle of the night, you know, from, from ambush. Andrew Pickens was at the end of the column. But Andrew Pickens was an experienced Indian fighter. He, he fought in the uh, First Cherokee War, 1758-1761. And what Pickens knew was that when you charge the Indians, they, they left. If you, if you stood there still, they were going to be picking you off one by one. But when you charge them, their plan was just to leave so that, you know, they could uh, fight another day. And um, so Pickens, from the rear, he rushed all the way to the front, and he broke the Cherokee attack. But in the meantime, Francis Salvador is wounded over off to the side. And the um, militiamen, and it was very dark, they saw the figure crouched over uh, Francis Salvador. But they assumed that it was his manservant. And many of the leading men during those times had um, um, body servants, manservants, these were slaves, who would be attending to them. Francis Marion had an attendant. Um, uh, Andrew Pickens did. Uh, Colonel William Washington did. You know, it's, this was a, a common thing. So what the militiamen thought was, well, um, Salvador's manservant is attended to him. Uh, you know, let's shoot these Indians that are running away from us. Well, what they realized later, they didn't know it at the time, was that Francis Chavador was being scalped alive. Um, and he died shortly thereafter. And I think he may have been the only casualty from that battle of, of the Seneca. But the plan was, with um, Williamson's group, was total annihilation. And what the um, Europeans realized in uh, 1761 was that was the only way that you were going to have uh, Victory over the Cherokees is just, you know, total, total war warfare. And, you know, I, I'm not a Cherokee apologist. I mean, I think they're fascinating to study them and so forth. It just, these cultures did not understand each other. They could not coexist with each other. The system of justice was retaliation, 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 and where does that end? Um, they just could not live side by side. And what the um, Williamson's plan was to go to all 16 villages, burn every one of them to the ground, burn the rock to the ground, uh, shoot the pigs, um, you know, just just total annihilation. And that's what they did in town after town after town. And um, there was, you know, just some ambushing going on. There wasn't organized Cherokee resistance. Uh, it was just one skirmish after another with the Cherokees losing every time, and they got driven further and further and further into the um, uh, into the mountains and, you know, away from the uh, lower towns where Williamson was wreaking so much havoc. And uh, Andrew Pickens was right there with me doing this. He was, he was an Indian fighter. He was in a, a respected Indian fighter. And uh, the Battle of the Seneca happened on uh, August the 1st, 1776. On August the 12th, 1776, Andrew Pickens and Robert Anderson were approaching the uh, Cherokee town of Tomasi. This is what we're going to see October 17th. And Tomasi is beautiful. If you love South Carolina country, you're going to love Tomasi. And I encourage every one of y'all to, uh, to come for this field trip. But it was a peaceful Indian village on the banks of the Chiwi River. And um, uh, Pickens and Anderson had 60 men with them. Uh, they burned the town. They, they broke up. 
Robert Anderson took 35 men and went in one direction, and Andrew Pickens took 25 men and went in another direction. And uh, as Pickens was, you know, marching along, all of a sudden he sees a Cherokee brave in the distance running away. Like, okay, guys, let's go get that guy. So they start chasing after this brave. And they get into the middle of a uh, grass agricultural field, right in the middle of it. And as soon as they get in the middle of it, all of a sudden, 185 Cherokees rise up from the grass and completely surround Pickens and his men. So this is what is referred to as the green fight. And as many battles as Andrew Pickens was in, and he was in a lot of them, he was at Cowpens, a long list. He says this was the most intensive fight of his entire career. So what he did, he organized his men into two circles, an inner ring and an outer ring. And he would have the inner ring loading while the outer ring was fired. Then he had the outer ring loaded while the inner ring was fired. So this is how they fought off those 185 Cherokees and they were successful. Three times the ring was breached and he was fighting with rifle butts and uh, uh, hunting knives. There were no deaths on Pickens, among Pickens' men. Several men got wounded, but there were no deaths. And after an hour and 15 minutes, after 75 minutes, finally um, help arrived. Robert Anderson came up. Jonathan Downs, the defender of Fort Finley, the commander of the Little River Regiment, he arrived on the scene. Um, uh, Andrew Pickens' brother, Joseph, arrived. So all the help kind of got there at the same time. When Andrew, when uh, Joseph, uh, Jonathan Downs arrived, and as he was leading his men towards the ring fight, apparently he was holding his hand like this. And a musket ball came and went through his hand and lodged in his abdomen. And Jonathan Downs kept that musket ball in his body for the rest of his life, for about the next 30 years or so. That was the end of Jonathan Downs' fighting career, even though he continued to um, uh, help and participate with the Little River, Little River Regiment um, throughout the rest of the time. So, the ring fight, really the Battle of the Seneca and the ring fight are the only two recognized battles that happened during the Cherokee War of 1776. The rest of it was just annihilation. At the same time that the South Carolina troops were clearing um, South Carolina of the Cherokee towns, Griffin Rutherford in North Carolina was adopting the same tactics and, you know, driving the Cherokees into the mountains. And that winter, the Cherokees with um, few clothes, no food, no protection, no homes, they live in the uh, mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee throughout the winter. And, um, you know, they, they suffered mightily from that. I read one reference that said 2,000 Cherokees were killed. I'm not sure where those numbers come from. Uh, and in 1777, at the Treaty of DeWitt's Corner, uh, everything except for a five-mile strip of uh, western South Carolina was ceded to the uh, South Carolina provincial government, which was province at that time. And... Um, that was basically the end of, Cher of uh, the Cherokees uh, in, in South Carolina. The Cherokees respected and admired Andrew Pickens. Now, Pickens killed a lot of Cherokees, but they regarded him as one of the few people that they could, they could trust. And he, Pickens did keep his word to the Cherokees. And after the Revolutionary War, Andrew Pickens negotiated two treaties referred to as the Hopewell Treaties. And these occurred where the Clemson campus is now, where Andrew Pickens had his home. He built a home where the Battle of the Seneca occurred. 
Um, it has been moved, but um, uh, the Hopewell treaties were significant, um, and they established peace for a little while between the Creeks and the, uh, the United States government, and between the Cherokees and the United States government. But uh, that's basically the events that occurred during the Cherokee War of 1776. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. The Cherokees, did they have uh, muskets or were they still using or They had muskets. They, they were provided arms by the royal government. And the reason they were provided arms was so that they could shoot deer and provide deer skins. There were 50,000 deer skins a year that passed through Charleston Park. However, their weapons were always inferior. They would be weapons from the Hundred Years War or you know, all those wars that were happening in Europe. Once those weapons got worn out, they would be shipped over to um, America and given to the Cherokees for as a trade goods. Anybody else? Yes. They, uh, I know they were not Christianized at this time, uh, and uh, by the time of the Northern States, yeah. several tribes were Christianized, yes. and they all fought for the South, they were right. heavy for that. Yeah. For that good but when did they become Christianized? Okay, so this brings up a great point. Um, you know, the Cherokees finally realized that everybody was telling the Cherokees this. There's no hope for you whatsoever until you adopt the ways of the white man. And the Cherokees were really the only tribe that adopted the ways of the white man. And they adopted the ways of the white man wholeheartedly. At this time, about 1800, they were relegated to just a little bit of North Carolina, western Georgia, and uh, eastern Tennessee. And they developed a written language, they had a newspaper, they had a democratically elected government, they had a bicameral legislator, they had Christians minister, they welcomed missionaries into the Cherokee territories. The Moravians, who were leading scientists at the time, they set up mission after mission after mission, and the Cherokees became Christian. Um, and they kept their, you know, old culture as well, but they welcomed the ways of the white man, and they did everything they were supposed to do. And then in the 1830s, the worst thing possible happened to the Cherokees. Gold was found on their land. And the uh, United States government at that time wanted that land. What good are the Cherokees? You know, what, what are they going to do? So this is what led to the Trail of Tears. And, you know, all of this time, my point of view is, you know, it is what it is, and that's a hackneyed phrase. The Cherokees couldn't live in peace with the Europeans. But after the Revolutionary War, after the period of about 1800, they adopted the ways of the white man. And this is when they really got stabbed in the back. And who stabbed him in the back was Andrew Jackson, who the Cherokees fought with at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in the War of 1812. The Cherokees won, well, contributed mightily to the victory that Andrew Jackson had at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. When the um, movement started to uh, move the Cherokees into Oklahoma, those warriors who fought with Andrew Jackson went to the White House to ask him, say, hey, man, we saved you. He wouldn't stay with us. He rejected them. And uh, he shipped them to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears. So 16,000 Cherokees left at that time, and 4,000 on the right. Now, I have better feelings about that. But the rest of the time, I mean, it just, it is what it is. Who was all nervous about the, the uh, Catawba and the Cherokee and all that stuff? Yeah. They, they drew the, 
Wrong river. Yeah. Now, they do the same language. How did they communicate with the tree? Well, now that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, and this happened in 1450. So there weren't people around to record it. Uh, they would not have spoken the same language. And the Creeks did not speak the same language as the Cherokees. So, um, you know, and it was not a very formal treaty, you know. But, uh, good question. Yes. It, it was in western Georgia. There was so much gold discovered that the United States government set up a mint in the line. Yeah. Um, so, you know, western Georgia. Uh, one reason I'm so familiar with this is uh, I've got a degree in landscape architecture, and uh, my thesis was uh, on Cherokee medicinal practices um, and the site of my research was the chief band uh, plantation in Spring Place, Georgia, which is in western uh, Georgia. Um, chief band was the richest Cherokee Indian chief. He had a thousand uh, acres. He had the leading agricultural practices. The Arabians helped him with that. He had a hundred slaves. He built a mansion, a full moon mansion, but it's magnificent. There was a dungeon in that's where he kept his slaves there uh, to be punished for one um, reason or another. Chief Ann was a murderer. He died by murder. Um, but he was a, a leading figure in the Cherokee culture. He, uh, he died in 1809, and his son, Rich Joe, took over. And he was a little bit more progressive. Um, but, uh, you know, they were all moved. Well, if there are no more questions, I appreciate everybody's attention. And, uh,